On the behalf of the Institute for Sustainable Food Systems and the Sustainable Agriculture Program at Kwantlen Polytechnic University, I want to welcome you. We're very pleased that you're here with us this evening. Richmond, this campus is home to KPU Sustainable Agriculture Programs, and, and Richmond is a full partner in uh, what we are trying to achieve. The Institute for Sustainable Food Systems and the Sustainable Agriculture Program are unequivocally dedicated to advancing agriculture and food systems that are foundational to sustainable society. We do this through calculated and integrated program of applied research, education like our undergraduate degree program, and extension programming such as the small farm session at the Pacific Ag Show, the uh, Tawasson First Nation and Richmond Farm Schools, the small farm enterprise budgets that we have recently produced and are available to the public, and tonight's public forum, all designed to uh, create awareness and provide tools for uh, farmers and our communities to advance agriculture. Further, we're particularly dedicated to working at the community and the local government level and supporting local and regional food system initiatives. And if you ever have an idea for applied research, education, or extension programming, we hope that you'll feel comfortable contacting us. And uh, uh, please don't hesitate, because we would uh, really uh, appreciate the opportunity to work with you. Before beginning, I would like to gratefully acknowledge that we are gathering this evening on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish peoples. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Tawasson First Nation Elder Ruth Adams, who will offer a blessing for our gathering tonight. Ruth. Good evening, everyone. My, my Aboriginal name is Questania from my grandmother's side, and that was from her family in the Naimo. And this is, we're on Musqueam land, so I, I welcome you all here on behalf of the Musqueam First Nation. And you just go over the river, and that's where we are, Sawasan First Nation. And I'm really honored to be here to represent First Nations, because First Nations have always been involved in their, in their own uh, gardening and their own herbs and our medicines, hey? I'm not one of them. I don't, I don't garden. I'm not very good with gardening in the earth. But I do gather people, and that's why I'm here. And I'm honored to be a part. A partner with Kent. I brought Kent over to our First Nation. And now we've got a small farm school at Swasson First Nation. So I'm, I'm honored to have to have that happen and also honored to be here with my regalia and I'll, and I'll sing this song and this song is from Slave Tooth Chief Dan George and I'll just do a little blessing and then I'll do the song because the song really gives a whole blessing to everyone. So on behalf of my ancestors, I welcome you all here to Muscoyan First Nation Traditional Territory and on behalf of my grandmother, Sophia Jacobs, because she was uh, related to the point. So this is all part of all my relations. So when we do all my relations, we're, we're very protocol about everything. So it usually takes us days to do all of our things because we don't forget anybody. Everybody has to be included. So uh, I do this because I, I'm also Catholic. I was Catholic, but I do my prayers in, in both ways, so you can say that uh, I'm diverse. <laughs> so, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, dear Creator, I ask your blessing on this room, on this space tonight, and for Richard Bullock, who is going to do a presentation, and bless all of us here that are going to be learning, learning what is going on and helping to participate and make good things happen for all of us human beings, animals, and all the, everything that are in the water. So bless us all here and let us all learn from one another with respect for each other and go out like a flower out of this room 
and tell what we've learned and get everyone to gather in. It's always one by one, one room by one room, one city by one city, one nation by one nation, dear Lord. So I ask you to bless us all here tonight and let us learn a lot and let us help our presenter that is here tonight to do his presentation and bless Kent Mullenix for the good work that he does with all of us. So I thank you for this blessing of tonight, dear Lord, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you would stand for this, because this is an honor song for Chief Dan George. Remember, don't forget you're all my relations. It used to be just as First Nations, but everyone that we say welcome to, you're our relations, you're living with us in our traditional territories. So you're part of us, so never feel like we're separated. We're all together, one big happy family. So welcome everyone and thank you, Kent. Thank you very much. Before we begin, uh, a little housekeeping. The, the uh, washrooms are across the hall or down the hall or downstairs. And um, you've been given some cards to write questions on. At the beginning of our break, we'll gather those cards from you. And, and uh, Mike Bomford, uh, Faculty in Sustainable Agriculture, and Rebecca Harbett, also faculty at the back uh, will we'll, uh, gather those cards. So look for them or, or me. And then we're going to uh, uh, organize those questions into central themes and, and uh, bring forth the, the complement of questions that best represent the interests of the audience to present to Mr. Bullock. And uh, there'll be opportunity for some uh, audience uh, feedback and, and questioning as well. So um, I'm also pleased to uh, introduce David Ryle, a longtime Delta farmer and current president of the Delta Farmers Institute, to introduce our guest speaker this evening. David, please. Thanks, Kent, and good evening. It's a real honor, Richard, to be here this evening to introduce 
you to the crowd. I know many of them know you, but I thought I would give a few experiences that we've had. Richard's been involved in agriculture for more than 45 years, and he's gone, come from the grassroots, and he's gone right into an executive positions, and he's, he's done it with great finesse. Richard might not quite agree, but Richard, I think that uh, our experiences that we had with you at the ALC, uh, you always welcomed us, and unfortunately, we were there for reasons that I know you saw plenty of, and that was uh, many people want to be taking land out of the land reserve. You know, we originally, about 20 years ago, I was in Surrey, dead center of Surrey, and we moved down to Delta, and we thought, boy, we're going to get rid of all those urban problems. We're going to live on agricultural land. I, we went as far west as we could, and we thought that's what we were going to do was farm, because we were on the LR land, and we were going to be left alone. But we've spent more time defending our, our rights to farm and keeping it farmable than we did in Surrey. And this is also even in a municipality that really generally supports agriculture, and that's Delta. And I think it's a bit of a shock when we did a little study a few years ago. We hired a couple of consultants to do a plan for agriculture in Delta. And lo and behold, one of the first things they discovered uh, about in the last 10 years, we've lost 7 to 8% of our agriculture land in Delta. It's incredible. And I know we had some politicians in that meeting, and they said, well, where did it all go? Like, we don't, we don't have subdivisions. And no, it was senior governments that have been taking our land. So whether it's the port, the rail, or the last go around was the South Fraser Primer Road, which took 230 acres from us. And Richard, you played a big part because they had to go visit Richard and the group over there, Richard. And Richard said to them, well, probably we're not going to be able to stop you, but we better get something for agriculture out of this deal because you keep splitting it up, making it harder for the farmers. And losing 230 acres, we don't want to lose that industry in Delta. So Richard said to them, you better go talk to those boys over there in Delta, and you better do something for them. And they did. And what we got out of it was an irrigation system and parallel roads, some overpasses. Uh, they ended up spending about $60 million for us to help put back some of that production that we lost in the 230 acres. And then Richard asked this, this evening when I showed up, he says, how's it going? And I said, you wouldn't believe how those farmers are kissing that irrigation system because we all know how dry it's been. And it's still not 100%, but I would say in two years we're going to be pretty happy and hopefully we can shape, shake some hands, Richard. You, you know, some of the politicians that promised us water from east to west and Delta. But those are the kind of issues that Richard stood up for. I'm just giving you one example. Richard saw us more than that. But he always was there for us. And Richard, you, they came to listen to you, so I better stop talking. But I just <laughs> wanted to give you an experience, you know, that Richard really stood up for us. And I guess at the end of the day, maybe that's why he's not there anymore. So Richard, come on up. Yeah, this is, this is a goofy deal. Um, you know, you get fired, usually you're sent out to left field and never show up and uh, be quiet. But it, it wasn't a, a few days after uh, somebody pulled the plug on, on yours truly that I got a phone call from Kent and he said, you know, people might like to listen. And, and that's good. And, and uh, it, it's the kind of thing that you hear um, 
about agriculture through agriculture and if you stand up and uh, I, I took it as an honor to get fired for quite frankly because I think uh, I was asked by uh, a journalist today um, uh, can you maybe give me an idea why you got the boot and I said you're gonna have to ask the premier um, uh, I really don't know there's probably a hundred reasons but what was the one that tipped the boat I'm not sure uh, but I take it as, as uh, a, a bit of a sign of honor that uh, we were standing up for agriculture. Uh, there certain parts of the province weren't maybe appreciating some of the things we were doing or, or did. And, uh, and there you go. And if you push back long enough and hard enough, uh, there's going to be consequences, and I accept those. Uh, but I also feel that, uh, like David, uh, we did make some some significant moves and and that was a good thing and I'd also while I got the opportunity um, and I shouldn't be talking about these things but there was a uh, a wonderful uh, email campaign that went around uh, people thanking um, thanking my, my myself and my family for um, the work that was done and I'd like to take this opportunity if there are uh, some of you in the room tonight that um, that did take the time to to respond I, I appreciate it and I'm humbled by it frankly um, none of us I, I don't think at least I hope none of us take these jobs for thanks uh, we take them because we think we're given the opportunity to to help in the things we believe in. Uh, I see this tonight. I didn't, I didn't know uh, I was an advocate, but I guess I am. Uh, and I was probably born into the position. So um, there you go. And, and it, it's also, again, very humbling to see on a gorgeous evening like tonight, uh, uh, people got all sorts of things to do when you're coming out to to listen uh, to to some little old dude like me. But um, I don't think it's it's this person you're coming out to to listen to. You're coming out to to talk about, hear about, think about one of the grandest occupations and the thing that keeps us all rolling, and that's agriculture. I never in my lifetime, and I was born into the business, uh, still in it, uh, some many, many years later, have ever, have I seen agriculture being talked about more in the press, around tables, around gatherings than is happening today. People get together today, they don't just get together and have a meal. They have, they're proud of what they can put on the table. They bring the food, they bring the wine, they bring the discussion. They talk about where they got this, where they got that. If you had asked me a number of years ago that we would have farmers markets springing up every bloody empty lot in every city. Nelson, I, we travel through Nelson. The whole town shuts down. The main street is shut down 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning till 4 o'clock Wednesday afternoon. You gotta walk. And you know, when you talk about agriculture, here you sit, and I think Harold's in the room, you sit on some of the finest agricultural land in the world, right? This, this building is maybe on top of some, but that's too late for that. But what's left is the best. And then I go over to, to Nelson, and, and um, we traveled you know, up and down that valley, and at the far end of Kootenai Lake, there's this gorgeous, gorgeous delta. And there's a co-op farming up there. But by and large, 
this farmer's market that is now going two days a week is being fed by little one acre, two acre, quarter acre chunks of agricultural land that have been scraped out of the side of those mountains. Those of you who've been to the Kootenays in that particular valley, there isn't any agricultural land to speak up except along the river there's a little bit. But there's abundance. And the kids and the people that are there to share this, it's incredible. I walked through there at 10 in the morning, the sh shells were full. I went back, I made a point of going back with my commissioners and we went back at the end of the day, there wasn't a damn thing left there. And we heard that there hadn't been a thing left there since about 12.30 or one o'clock, but the place was still jammed because this has become what people now use as a community gathering spot. They come to buy some food. I brought some stuff, I grew a little bit of some of it's pretty shaky, but, <laughs> but it's there and it's sold. And somebody's break, baking muffins and cookies, and I couldn't keep away from those. But agriculture is important, and the land is bloody important. Two weeks ago, I went up to the Peace. That's the other thing I was asked to come up and paddle the peace because of the Site C issue that's going on up there. And you know, I was asked about it on the radio this morning and it was a thrill to be asked to go up, first of all. Second of all, the folks up there that are trying to put a stop to that thing um, they're swimming against the current. They're really swimming against the current. And my observation is this, that if that thing's ever going to be slowed down or have a second look, it's going to be the First Nations that are going to do it with their court cases. I don't think the government is listening to you or I on some of these issues. And, and I'm not criticizing the government, I'm just saying it. They're determined to go ahead, and the only thing that's going to stop that is the First Nations challenges, I think, that are in court. They were this week or last week, and um, we'll hear what happens there. But this is a valley I've had the pleasure of, of being in I don't know how many times over, over my lifetime for a whole bunch of reasons, but this is a special pay, place on this, on this earth, and that agricultural land is really cool. Not only is the agricultural land cool, it's, it's a gorgeous place. The critters come down off of the hillsides in the winter because they can hide. They can get on those south slopes and it's still maybe 35 below zero and the wind's howling up above them, but there, they're out of the wind, the sun's on the side of the mountains, there is no snow, they can graze. And this time of year, the summers, as I was going down the river, the deer, the elk, the moose, the mums are having their babies on the little islands and they're there because they're safe. And they've been doing that for centuries, millennia. And mom leaves the babies there and goes up on the side of the hill. She swims back across the river. It's not far. Goes and grazes and comes back to her little ones because she can leave them. That's going to disappear. But that's what somebody put on this little green earth for us. And above that, the land is incredible, absolutely incredible. And we're going to fill it up with water. I was asked about that. I guess it was probably the day after I got fired. And I, uh, 
and, and somehow it comes out, and, and anybody that's been around me for a while, I really don't, I have a tough time writing things down, I, I, but I can think, and, and it, it came out of me that it was a sin against humanity, and that seems to be have taken off. And it is, it's a sin against humanity when we take these things and cover them up. And it's also a sin against humanity and when we take this little bit of agricultural land we got in this province and we want to do all sorts of things with it that we shouldn't be doing. And that doesn't say we don't have to grow. Because we do have to grow. Communities have to grow. But I think what we were trying to do and I hope it carries on and we continue to do is that we work with the communities, we work with people like Harold, we work with municipalities, we work with local politicians and planners, and we say here's agricultural land and I think that agricultural land should be used as much as possible. In fact, it should only be used for agriculture. And agricultural land should not be Use. The first thought when communities grow should not be to spread on agricultural land. That should be absolutely the last thing we do when there are no other options, when we've exhausted everything else. That's what happens. Maybe. But along with our citizens, we make those decisions. And you give it up very, very very difficultly. And that's the kind of issues that we were dealing with. And that's what we thought we were going to continue to do, and I hope we continue to do it. I'm not going to second guess anything that goes on um, since I've been removed from there. I, I've always had a feeling that you know, I, some organizations have this term and this, this place for past presidents. I've always felt past presidents should be taken out and drowned somewhere because, you know, they're past. I'm past. And let's just hope that we all are vigilant to make sure that we carry on. Because what we do here is, is, is so important. And agriculture, I've had, the, I've had really a, quite a, a, an unfortunate, a fortunate career. I've traveled the world. I've seen agriculture uh, practiced. Uh, in strange lands, uh, and, and, and you know, there's, there's really, I'm not sure there's any place like North America that regards its food producing lands less than, than we do. No place else in the world treats their land like we do. I had a, I had a little story to, to emphasize that, I, t I was a young kid taking a delegation to China many, many years ago. It was just after, oh, it was probably 1980 or 81. Uh, hasn't, hadn't been long after the Cultural Revolution came to an end. Everybody was still wearing, the Chinese were all still wearing their Mao outfits. And, um, you know, the folks at the universities were just coming back off to the land after they'd been sent out to be re-educated and uh, those that uh, got educated somewhere else in the world, in the US or Canada or Europe, that couldn't wait to speak English to some of us. And uh, anyhow, I took a delegation of very esteemed agriculturalists across the country. Uh, all of them had PhDs. And I have to admit to you here I don't have a PhD. I barely got a grade 12 education, for God's sake. So I was leading this crowd of eminent folks. And one of them was a, a professor from Guelph. And we were off in the middle of China somewhere. And he was giving his lecture. And his lecture, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing with this. How do I move it, Kent? I got a bunch of pictures, but you can flip those anyhow. The guys, this fella from Guelph, his, he had a P, got a PhD on growing vegetables on raised beds. 
I don't know a hell of a lot, but my grandmother used to grow vegetables on raised beds. <laughs> and this guy's got a PhD on it. I says, well, you know, you just you bring it up about 12, 18 inches, you square it off a little bit, you pat the edges down, plant your stuff, and there's your raised bed. Anyhow, he had this long dissertation, and he, he had it up on the thing, and he went on for two or three hours. And uh, just before noon, he finished, and, and this, this kind little Chinese professor took him by the arm and said, I'd like to, to show you, Dr. Such and Such, something, and, and come with me. So they went out, and, and he went out behind the university and out to their experimental fields, and, and he showed them their raised beds that they'd been doing for 5,000 years. <laughs> this fellow left our delegation, got on the next plane home. Nobody heard from him again. He left his bags the whole 10 yards. I'm not sure what the hell, but that's what agriculture's all. We bugger things up. There, they're feeding 1.4 billion people feeding them well, and now they're starting to export food, and they use every inch. Here we think we've got nothing but land and we can waste it. Even the ducks walk down the road on the edge so they don't get run over. The ponds are full of fish, and they're feeding their people. They're feeding their masses, and we're going to have to help feed them some more. I went up north, Fort Nelson, and saw a revelation. Young farmers up there growing tomatoes, melons, carrots, corn, cattle. Guys figured, why can't we do it? Climate has changed and will continue to change, and we've always felt that we don't have any frontiers left. Don't kid yourself. There's land up there that is beautiful. And when they're finished digging it up, we insist, and the ALC insists, I hope, that they put it back in a shape better than they found it, but that does not get you to yes in a hurry. And that's a big concern that I have. Some of that land up there, I took a shovel and I took a tensiometer and I took all the rest. pH is seven. You can dig as far as you can dig and you never get to a rock. It's beautiful. You watch the temperatures, which I do now, that area of Fort Nelson is always a degree or two warmer than the Peace River. The sun stays up longer, and they can grow food to beat hell. It's warmer, longer sun. When winter comes, it comes today, and it's over. When spring comes, it comes today, and it starts. And these young fellows are feeding the people up there now instead of trucking the stuff. And it's big business. But they had the guts to do it. Primarily, they had to do it. They had nothing to do in the summer, these, these few fellows had to do it. They, in the winter, everything's frozen. They can go out and do what they have to do. In the summer, they decided, well, we're going to feed the oil and gas people with our own stuff. And they're doing a hell of a job. And we've got. The Riles here, their young daughter, is involved in, how many did you say farmer's market she's delivering to now? I think it's five. <laughs> five farmer's markets, all with organic food, all from the lower mainland and moving about. So those are the kind of things that we have to deal with. Communities have to grow, we understand that but they have to grow with agriculture in mind. And that's the other thing that I think we should talk about. Agriculture is a big business. 
and it has a huge spectrum of people that operate within it. All from those, the, the little folks that are producing very little and go to the farmer's market to the big boys that are shipping product all over North America, all around the world, our cherry industry in the Okanagan um, started about, what? Christine Dendy probably got going about the mid-80s. Everybody thought she was nuts. Summerland has done a tremendous job developing new varieties that come later, some come earlier. We stretch our season now in the Okanagan in, in the cherry business. It starts sometime in mid-June. It'll be, uh, they'll be harvesting maybe this year a little earlier, but it'll be going well into the mid-September with all the new varieties. And those things are shipped all over the world. Big business. A number of years ago, People were saying, get rid of the land. You can't do anything. All there was doing is bitching and complaining. You can't make a living at it. Now these young people are making a fortune. But they're doing it right. And we cannot. We've got the argument. You've got the argument down here. And this is one that I, I think we have to deal with. Is, you know, there's all this land that is laying vacant down here. And somebody did a study. Kent, not long ago, about all the, the land that's been bought up by various peoples and they're not doing anything with it. Well, my suggestion is just leave them doing nothing with it. But don't let them take it out of the ALR and develop it. Because at some point in time, somebody's going to come along and that land will be just fine. We had a big plot out in... Uh, mission and it was all full of brambles and somebody said oh you can't farm anything on here look at all the brambles and the blackberries and this and that uh, somebody came along and said geez this is a pretty good piece of ground took a, uh, a machine in there and about four days later the blackberries were all gone and this is one of the most beautiful blueberry fields you'd ever seen but somebody wanted to do it and if we let the land go just because it can't be worked, that's not good enough. In the Okanagan, we've got the argument that's been going on. We're prepared to save prime agricultural land, and some people decide that prime agricultural land is agricultural land that's scaled in one to two of the, the seven scales. Well, in the Okanagan, I don't think there are many tree fruits or grapes that are growing on land that's much better than three, four, five, and six. That grows the best tree fruits in the world is that weak, sandy land that you add a little bit of water with now drip irrigation and feed them when they're necessary and that's what grows good stuff. But some people look at that. I had a person come, we were, this was years ago, not that many years ago, we were planting one of the farms and it was just up from, from the East Kelowna Hall and the church and all the rest. Uh, this little place was well looked after. They had the Lord sticking out right next to us, so we were okay. But we were planting there and, the, and there was a bus came by with a whole bunch of British tourists on it. and and. And when you're planting a new orchard, it's, it, in the Okanagan, it's a hell of a mess because there's rocks laying everywhere. It looks like, you know, the world has come to an end and you've got this machine that comes behind you and you plant a tree every two feet and it covers it up, but it doesn't do a very good covering it up because the rocks are so bad. And this woman comes out, she walks down the road and she was looking, looking, and she came up to me and she says, my God, this is pathetic land. <laughs> what do you expect to grow here? And of course, it is pathetic land, but my trees just loved it. And it, you know, it, three years later, it's one of the finest orchards in the valley. But this is what agriculture is all about. You have to want to do it. 
and um, we can do it and we will do it and we have to one of the big things we have to do is to make sure we I I hope we are I think we are I think we were getting it through people's minds that the agricultural land reserve is here to stay. This thing's been a 40-year struggle, and Harold knows more about this and some of you in this room than, than I do. I was, I was about 25, 26 when it came in. Our family um, had some bloody interesting discussions around the kitchen table on this discussion. My mother and father thought it was the end of the world. Um, they came from Europe, were lucky to get out alive. Their story's not special. This whole country's built on these things. And somebody came along and said, I can't do what I want to do with this land. And we were living and still are on, on, on land that sits looking over the valley. Uh, I mean, as real estate, it, it's pretty cool stuff. As farmland, there's no better. But the fights that went on, and if my mom and dad knew I was chair at, uh, of the land commission, and, uh, and if they knew I got fired, they'd say you'd bloody well deserve to get fired anyways. But, but it was, they went to their graves deciding this wasn't the thing that should have happened. But the next generation, that was my generation, felt that this was the thing that we needed to do if we wanted to farm. Our family would not have persevered or stayed farming if it wasn't for the ALC. And it's the best thing that ever happened to us. It's treated us really well. You know, our roof doesn't leak. There's food on the table. Dogs come in at night, lay down, they're happier than hell. But if it hadn't been for the ALC, I wouldn't have been able to go out at night and pee in the backyard because there were too many neighbors. <laughs> you know, these, uh, this doesn't sound like a big thing, but this is a big thing for some of us. <laughs> But we got to take the speculative value out of farmland. And my concern is there, we were moving down that road. I thought we had got beyond that. But some of the changes may have given hope to the speculators again. That's my concern. I may be all wet, I may be wrong. I don't want to stand up here and talk to you uh, like an angry old man. I'm not an angry old man. I just want to make sure that the next generation, my children's children, your children's children, have an opportunity to grow food for their neighbors and the people in the world. There is no better feeling than walking along a harvested crop, whatever it is, and saying, wow, this is going to market. This is going to go on to somebody's table. And every year is different. Every year is a challenge. And the toughest part of farming is not the physical. Hell, that's, if you're healthy, if you're not healthy, you can do that. The toughest part of farming is the mental part. Two years ago, my son gave me a call down here and he said, Dad, we just had a hailstorm. All the bins were out ready to harvest the crop. Three million bucks down the tube. 25 minutes. What do I do? My only advice was, John, 
send everybody home, take a week, mourn, it's gone, and then get ready for next year. And that is tough to do, but we do it year in and year out. And every year has its challenges. It's not the physical work. Never, never have I seen a season where we've had less water. What's it doing to the berries? What's it doing to the potatoes? We've got to deal with it. So now you dig down and figure out how we do it. And that's what farming is all about. Farmers, there's just too damn many people buying farmland that think this is an easy business. And when it isn't, the applications to the ALC come flooding in. I can't make it. I bought this land. I paid such and such. How can you do it? I can't. You, 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 nobody can do it. It isn't easy. But now, I want to do something else. Now I want a non-farm use. I want to park some trucks on my property out here in Delta. The neighbor over there, you know, he's got, he's got two trucks, I want 50. And then the ALC has to come along and, and jump down their throat. They have to work and get together with Harold and all the rest of it, and it goes nuts. Because people look at agriculture as an easy business, as something, and it's land, and anybody can do it. Not anybody can do it. Non-farm uses are wonderful until they become more important than the farm product that is produced on that land, and that's when we get into trouble in this province. And that's where we're going to get into trouble if we're not careful, and that's where your vigilant is going to have to help. We cannot allow that to happen. And I've seen it time and time again. And the ALC has stepped in and done its job. And it's not just the ALC. The ALC has to work along with the communities. And the communities, my dream always has been that at some point in time, if we carry on and we do the right things and, and the right generations come along and all us old farts get out of the way, excuse my farm talk, and the young people that respect the land and respect society come along and they get together, communities are going to understand how important the ALC is or how important their farmland is that the ALC should no, no longer be necessary. That's a dream that I had. That's where I thought we were taking this thing. That's where we should take it. We respect farmland and communities respect it. They don't need and we shouldn't need a law to make sure farmland is looked after. We've had to have a law because people think farmland is a commodity that all it is is to be left there until we need it for something else, and then it can come out and we can do whatever we want for it. This is one of the only parts of the world, North America, that that's the case. That we actually need laws to tell people to keep farmland in place. And on other issues in this country, we're finally coming around, and now we're relying on the First Nations to do the right thing because our ancestors probably had a pretty good idea and signed treaties that we're not prepared to keep. Am I being heretical with saying, saying that? If I am, it's too damn bad because we should have been saying it. There's no way that some of these things we're fighting in the courts should have to go to the courts. And there's no way 
that agriculture should have to fight for its right to remain on the land that it has today. You know, I've got Melanie Somerville, who sits right here in front of me, is, is doing, and she, she's getting her PhD, and, and I sometimes wonder, and excuse me, all of the, those that have the PhD here in the room, that, you know, quite often I, I think that maybe you're sitting on the top of a pin and, and, and really worrying things to death, but, but really you do some good work. And Melanie's, um, I, first, I first got to know Melanie. She, she's a character, and, and uh, I was chair of the Farm Ministry Review Board, and this was a number of years ago, and, and uh, we were over in Victoria having a board meeting, and I think it was Melanie's first or second day on the job, and we were having this major debate about, I don't know what the hell it was, but it was something to do with the supply management, and you know, we were going on, I was going on, and, and this, this young little girl in the corner sticks her hand up, and, uh, and I says, yeah, I didn't know who the hell it was, but I says, yeah, you got something, and she says, Mr. Chairman, You've been going on for some time, but I don't agree with you. The whole room, there was, everybody stopped. I mean, just uh, how does, she was telling the chair she didn't agree, just got hired about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> but you know, that's, those are the kind of, those are the kids that we want. Those are the questions that we want. And here she is tonight, almost finishing a PhD. She's doing a whole host of things, and her PhD is, has a lot to do with who's buying up farmland in Canada and, and South Africa and other parts of the world. And agriculture, while we're fighting in this province whether we need the ALR or we should have the ALR, the rest of the world In, and, and in this world is getting involved in all sorts of people buying agricultural land as investments. Pension funds. Today, pension funds are some of the biggest buyers of agricultural land. Huge tracts. Melanie could tell you more about that. Huge tracts. I was contacted by a fund not long ago. They, they control $300 million and want to buy farmland. Is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I really don't know. But I do know that somebody sees agriculture as a long-term investment and a good one. And here we are arguing whether we should keep our agricultural land in place. And we, we've Do we need different ways to finance agriculture? Is this a different way to finance agriculture? Do we all need to be owning every stitch of land that we operate? I, I, I've seen some interesting and wonderful farms where the farm operator doesn't own a hell of a lot of land, but he leases huge tracks and do a tremendous job and they're doing just fine, thank you, because they don't have the big nut of the mortgage to crack. And they buy little pieces as they go down the way. It's, it's a different way that we have to find different ways to organize, but whatever we do, we have to keep the land in one piece. And um, Kent, I'd like to you know, I, I could go on all night, but I, I, I just like to say this. It's been a privilege. Uh, the five years I spent at the ALC was probably the most rewarding time I've had in agriculture. I don't know if we achieved much, but we achieved a little bit. We obviously pissed somebody off. <laughs> Really? <laughs> so that's a good sign. Uh, but this is a worthy cause. 
and, and look at you. Look how many people came in here tonight. They didn't come to see me. You came to talk about agriculture. You came to listen. You came to see. This, this is something that we all need three times a day. We got to eat. And the closer you get it to home, the better off it is. And I'm proud as hell of what we've achieved over the, the 45 years. It's a changed business today. My father would not recognize the tree fruit industry today. What my child, my son can do with his hands, I couldn't even dream of doing. What they're growing, I'm not sure who I was talking with tonight. David, we were chatting tonight. The product that is being produced today is unsurpassed. It's never been better. And when you get closer to your market, like we're doing, your daughter's doing, she's out there looking the, looking the consumer in the eye as a retailer, here's the product I've got for you. She's getting instant feedback, and that feedback is serving us all well because it's going all through the system. She has to have the perfect fruit or the best fruit that she can possibly do or whatever she is selling. And it can be done and it should be done. And there's all sorts of different ways to do it. I'm proud of what we're doing. I'm proud of this province. I'm proud of that legislation that I was in charge with for a while. And I hope to God you people keep your eye on it to make sure it's not pulled apart. And with that, I want to have a chat. I want to hear from you guys. I want to, listen, you're here. I, I, they're looking. <laughs> they want you to say something. This is your, this is your stuff. This is your future. I'm, my, my career is done. Uh, but it's been one hell of a ride. And if there's anything I can do, I'll keep doing it in the little places I can. And it always have an opinion, and that opinion will be shared if it's asked. But I want you guys to chat tonight. Let's, let's have a talk. Rebecca Harbett. I'm one of the faculty here in the Sustainable Ag Department. Um, I think it's been lovely. Wow, we got a huge number of questions, which is, we're going to give them all to Richard so he can answer every one of them tonight and get back to you individually. No. So we'll do our best. So what we did is we just went through. There were a lot that were along the same lines, and we kind of grouped those together, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, what we'll do is I'll read the question. I'll let you respond, and then if there are any follow-up questions from the audience that are directly related to that question that he just answered, then stick your hand up. Samantha, where's Samantha? Oh, she's in the back. She's going to come up front and keep her eye out for any hands, and just flag her down if you've got a burning question. Whoever she gets to first gets to ask the question. How's that? Sounds All right, great. are we ready? OK. Let's start with an easy one. How can we eliminate speculative ownership of agricultural land? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's easy. Make sure that if you've got agricultural land, you either use it or get the tax the hell out of it, one or the other. Now, th th this has been an issue that we've talked about for a lot of years. A lot of people have um, with government. and. Um, you know, I think the other thing is if we stick with to the guns and the ALC is the ALC and the ALR is the ALR, people get the idea that they buy farmland um, and that's the end of the story and we don't have to listen to all the sad tales I didn't know. Um, I thought we were going down that road. I hope we are going down that road and if we carry on going down that road and don't feel and the commissioners don't feel sorry for the story they hear, um, and people start to find out that uh, they're not going to, they bought a piece of farmland, they're not going to turn it into everything else, uh, including Disneyland. 
this thing over time, I think, will shift. But we've got to be tough. And then you get fired. shift quickly. So how do you stay on top of what the next thing that they want to do to the land is? <laughs> like to, yeah. to be informed. I'm not sure you do. I, I, I mean, what are they shifting from or to? Well, now it's a big, huge house. It, it's, well, and then, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, again, that's an issue that you're going to have to deal with um, municipalities. I think they are struggling with that issue, put, you know, large houses on agricultural land. Um, Harold may have more on that. I think there's, uh, there's some rules in place or coming into place that uh, require or, or confine them to maximum footprints and all the rest of those things. I'm not really... Uh, sure of all of them, but it's it's a problem here. It's a problem in the Okanagan, and um, uh, th there's people dealing with it. But what's a big house to some, to others isn't. There's some monsters around. There's no question. And the and the sad part of that is once that happens, I got into a real fight. Where's where's the people from the the Real Estate Foundation. I got into a bit of a, a Donnybrook. Uh, uh, we were invited one afternoon to, to, Brian Underhill and I were invited one afternoon to go down and visit him. Uh, and we had an, an, a real nice discussion going until an, uh, an issue like this came up where uh, one of the fellas uh, said he had uh, three and a half or four acres and uh, an acre of it was taken up by house. And I said, what are you doing with the other three? And he says, oh, it's just laying there. And I says, maybe you should let some young farmer come in. Well, that started the Donnybrook. Of course, it's my three acres. It's my five acres. I'm going to do what the hell I want on it. And uh, you keep your hands off it. So it's a big issue. Uh, and I'm afraid I don't have an easy answer for you. OK. So going to smaller committees to make decisions about the ALR. Was it good, or what is good, and what is not good about it? Uh, the smaller, uh, this is an issue that, that has dogged the ALC for, for quite some, some time. It was brought in, I think it was in um, 2000 or 2001, where the ALC went from a seven or nine member board, if I was correct, to um, uh, six regions like we have presently uh, with three people on each region and um, and then decisions in those regions were handed over and and are handed over today to those uh, committees there's there's good things about it and there's bad the good things are that you have people that supposedly know the area know the countryside uh, the bad things are that from time to time those those uh, committees are felt to be um, uh, regional and should be doing what the local politicians or uh, or provincial politicians from those those areas want. Um, there's good, there's bad. It's a very difficult operation to uh, manage for the chair. Uh, because you've, you've basically got six individual ALCs around the province. Uh, decisions uh, that they make are not consistent. Uh, as chair, you get calls from um, all sorts of people around the province suggesting why are they getting a decision over here on these conditions where the same conditions over here were not. So. Um, I don't want to get into into that argument. I, I wrote a report in in 2010. I was asked to when I was appointed, and after reviewing what was going on, I had recommended that uh, we should go back to uh, a provincial panel. Uh, that obviously didn't fly.
I noticed that uh, when I looked at their, their bios that there weren't a lot of farmers in the north, that there's a lot of people from forestry and different, uh, different uh, occupations that had nothing to do with farming. Could you maybe comment on, on how the, uh, the regional committees are made up now? Uh, the regional committees were, were put together by the minister um, and uh, the board resourcing office. Um, uh, we at the commission had no input whatsoever, but if I remember correctly, uh, certainly the northeast corner has, um, I think all of them have farming backgrounds. Uh, I think um, the interior panel, there's two ranchers and uh, a th the third has some forestry background. I'm not going to go over all of that. Frankly, I, I don't necessarily believe that you need all farmers on these panels. You know, different points of view uh, are good. I've, I've always been a believer that uh, if you have uh, a good mix of thoughtful people that stick with the legislation as it's written, operate it with the regulations that they're given, and, and that becomes their framework, uh, the decision making is good and 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 having different points of view from my from where I sit I've never thought that was a bad thing in fact I think it's a strength in many cases there's all sorts of people from various backgrounds that can bring you skills in your decision making process and uh, that, o that goes for more than the ALC that goes for most places I I think if you if we had all farmers uh, that could be probably a reasonably dangerous situation because then you get too centric on, on one point of view. I, I think good points of view, good people, good backgrounds, understand the legislation. Uh, when this new group was brought in, uh, we had six days of um, intense uh, education, something that's never been done before, and I think they went off to do their job. So that's my personal view. So we got a lot of questions about the future of agriculture in British Columbia. Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? And what would you, um, what would you advise in order to support young farmers facing barriers of high land price and increased pressure on, on ag land? I'm bloody optimistic. I wish I was 25 years old again. Frankly, I've never seen agriculture healthier than it is today. And as I said at the beginning of my talk tonight, I've never seen agriculture discussed more, talked more, in the press more, around the dinner table more, uh, when you go out to uh, meet people, oh, you're, you're in the farming business. Jeez, that must be, a, you know, it, it's, a good, it's really good. Farmland uh, prices, how do I get into it, is difficult if you don't have a rich dad like uh, some, some have or not, or if, or if you aren't, uh, uh, you know, born properly and so on and so forth, it's difficult. But having said all of that, uh, even some of those that were born properly, we still had to go out and buy land because mom and dad weren't prepared to get off theirs. Um, but it's never been easy. It's never, never, when I read the history of agriculture, it's never, never been easy to get on agricultural land when I go back 5,000 years. But there are ways of doing it. You start small. And in this day and age, I think there's more ways to get involved in agricultural land than, than ever before. I think governments have to look at this with some creative minds. I think they have to open their minds up. And as I said before, just because you buy a piece of agricultural land means, doesn't mean that you can, you, you, you can just sit on it. I think there has to be something put in place that makes sure if there's some people that want to farm it, uh, proper leases are put in place. Uh, long-term leases because some of the crops we grow, we grow, in fact most crops, I don't care if it's a, uh, an annual crop or one that requires 25 years, you need a long-term vision and you have to be able to get on that land, sign leases that go from landowner to landowner. Uh, if you sign the lease with Bill and he sells 
to herald that lease has to carry along. And those are the kind of things that we have to get in place. There, as I said before, there's a lot of money coming into buying farmland. Pensions funds are doing that sort of thing. Well, they buy farmland, it still has to be farmed. Uh, you get a damn good education in agriculture. There, those things pay well, and it's a good way to get started in the business. Um, I've got a little experience in some parts, other parts of the world, and, and with farming. And, um, you know, on the farms we have down there, we've, we've got a good education. So I think our education system is failing us a bit uh, in terms of the applied agriculture. We're great on the science, but I'm not sure we're doing a very good job of, of um, training farmers. And I think we have to get it out of our head that farmers aren't stupid people. You know, farmers are bright, bright individuals. They handle huge amounts of money. They handle soils. They handle insects. They handle marketing. It's a big business. And it's one that requires all sorts of skills, and it, it resides in one little person with the green hat there. She has to know all of those things. And I'm not sure we're teaching that enough in our schools. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think we need to do more of that. And there are opportunities. And the other thing is you've got to start at the ground floor. You can't expect to get on a farm and be the biggest farmer in the world overnight. It takes time. It takes effort. Um, Jackie and I started quite small. We were young when we got married. We've had our issues over the years, but it turned out okay. Uh, but you've got to stick with it. And not everybody can be a farmer. That's the other thing. We've got a hell of a lot of people that figure, Jesus, if he can do it, I can do it. As I said before, it's up here that counts. It's a tough game. And farmers, a lot of them, some of them are born but a lot of them are make it just by determination. It's just like being a professional athlete. You've got to be able to take the lickens and come up and keep on going. And, and there's opportunities, um, but I don't think it's a hell of a lot tougher now than it's ever been. When I started, hell, I never had a nickel. And we bought our first farm. I paid $3,000 an acre up in the Okanagan. Today, $3,000 an acre doesn't buy you a Big Mac, but, you know, that was a lot of money then. You know how much $3,000 was for a little kid? So it's a big deal. But there are creative ways. There is money out there that is being put into farmland, and there's folks that don't know how to farm the land, and I think they should be making those lands available for those who want to. Okay, so how can we reframe British Columbia's farmland as an asset, as an asset, an investment to the BC government? I'm not sure we have to reframe it. We just have to get the BC government to understand that they've got one of their greatest and most treasured assets in the world right now. Uh, yeah, I, it doesn't need reframing. Um, I think probably what it needs is, um, is respect. And I'm not sure it's been deserved. It, 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 we've got the respect it deserves. Um, it should be on top of the list. It shouldn't be an afterthought. This is one of the most beautiful question cards I've ever seen, by the way, whoever drew that. <laughs> but it's a good follow-up. So how can we in Richmond and broader, shift the perspectives of the community to respect and appreciate the farmland. What do we do to foster that? I think just keep doing what you're doing. It's happening. It's happening as we speak. I was saying before, I've never seen agriculture being talked about as it is today. We've got farmers markets out there that I think 
10 or 15 or 20 years ago were, you know, you would have been a loony to even think of going one. The only farmer's market I knew a number of years ago was Pike's Market in Seattle, and then finally somebody decided to get the Granville Island going, and now you've got how many going on in Richmond out here? And, and as I said, they're all over the place. I think agric uh, agriculture has to, people like me and you and others have to just stand up and be proud of what the hell we do. You know, when I took, and I'm going to go back, maybe I shouldn't, but I will. I'll go, when I got appointed to the ALC, the day I walked into the office, was an awful day. I walked into the office, I opened the door and went in, and I walked down the hall, and I'm a pretty easy guy to get. Nobody's eyes were lifted. They all looked like they were a bunch of beat puppies. Looked like I was at the SPCA where, where nobody has fed anybody for a while. There was nothing but silence. And you know, when I left, that place is vibrant. Those kids are excited because we turned them loose and we stood behind them and I told them that if they've got a decision to make, we've got, I've got your back. And that's what we in agriculture all have to do. When people come up against us, we've got to tell them to go to hell. We got to tell them I'm proud of what I'm doing. We got to tell them I'm producing food for the rest of you people. Now leave us alone. And I think we've got to take ourselves and we've got to stand up and be proud of the business we do. And we've got to quit, frankly, as fa the farming community has to quit bitching. I don't have many friends in the farming community because I don't put up with bitching for very long. You know, it's a good business if you do it right, but it's a god-awful business if you think it's easy. And that's what we have to do. All of us have to stand up. And you've got this wonderful college here that is, is teaching agriculture. Agriculture's really part of their curriculum. That's amazing. Those are the kind of things we got to do. Okanagan College, one of the first issues that we dealt with when I was appointed was the Okanagan College wanted to put some track on one of their properties. Best agricultural land, number one in the valley. The first meeting we had, we said, I looked them in the eye, there's no goddamn way you're getting nothing. You're here, you're in the Okanagan, you've been here since 1986, you don't have one course on agriculture in your college. End of the meeting. Jeez, the, you, you thought the world had come to an end. Somebody finally, a, six or eight weeks later, or a month, eight months later, we got a call back, come on, we've got things to talk to you. They turned 180 degrees. They've now got a, a, a viticulture program. They've got a whole bunch of programs, and they're finally getting it. That's what we have to do. We have to stand up, be proud of what we do, and tell people to get the hell off our land. And if you bought it, that's it. You're stuck with it. If you don't want to farm it, you're stuck with it. And don't come to me with the next smartest idea in the world. I bought a piece of agricultural land, and do you know what I can do with that? A hundred things. The only thing they don't do is agriculture. That's what we have to do is stop all that. And Kent and his people have to keep doing what they're doing in this in this organization. Good stuff. When you don't get support from the local municipalities and you don't get support from the government, you know, constantly, I live in Richmond, and I'm tired every time you, one of the, some of the best farmland is in the south part of Richmond and Finn Road in that area. South of Three Road, and I've seen for years big homes, and you go to the 
municipality and say, and they blame it on the government, the provincial government, you go to them and they say, no, it's not ours, it's, uh, it's municipality. Harlan's only a, a one man. Harlan has fought for, for Richmond for years, but he's only one man. We've got a mayor that all he thinks of is, is homes. You used to be, it, it, like even in William Drove, you used to have maybe 20 homes, now there's about a thousand. You know, we're seeing more and more that offshore people buy our farm land, and they don't want they don't want to farm it, they want to have it in homes. And that's my, my complaint. My complaint is you have nobody to, when they dumped in asphalt, and there's asphalt and rebar and concrete. There's over a hundred tons of it was dumped in a farm and thin road. Ray Galway stood with a, with a, all our farmers and, and blocked the area, but the city of Richmond didn't get off their fat ass to help them. Another bit of Linda Reed from the Liberal Party, or, or, or that other clown, Susie. The environment guy, what he calls. You, you never hear anybody. Well, I, I guess I, I hear you, and I'm not going to get into those issues that are, are to deal with local provincial politics. Ask, I've, the, the ALR is, is, is there to help, and we have to work with our communities, and we have to, and I think they are. Pardon me? You have to get off the fence, I agree. We're pretty much getting off, sitting on, off the fence. We keep talking about yeah. the farms in British Columbia. We don't, and we still, ask how many people in this room uh, have been, go, go south to, to America and get their, 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 their pro, pro, produce. We have to do our, buy our produce in the 100 mile radius every summer and support the local people. I really believe that. If you want to see farms in British Columbia, you have to support your local people. And that's, I agree. That's the education we need to get out. Sounds good to me. a good relationship with each other. And when he says, well, you have to get to know one another, well, that's true. You have to know who's in your community and not, and not be afraid to get to know them and tell them what you are doing. As if, if we weren't doing that in Swas and First Nation, we, we would still be sitting there and all the land would be gone. We did the treaty so as we wouldn't lose the land. And the big part of this is that I come out here and a lot of our leaders are coming out to, to say that we need to be together to get things done. So it's building relationships between everyone in your community. Just like you said, the loggers, the whoever's in there, because we're fishers too, eh? So we have to do that. But I think the biggest thing he has said is that, for me anyways, your, your little community gardens, you have to start from there. And when you want respect, then you're going to have to bring the children up to learn how to just have a tiny little spot in your yard to do gardening. Everyone has to see it to, to, to get behind it. So these are the new ways of, uh, of farming today, is that it isn't stand all by itself. We First Nations can't stand by ourselves, and you can't all stand by yourselves as farmers. We all have to be together. So it's relationship building, getting to know each other, not judging each other, getting to know, well, how can I help you? How can you help me? And exchanging things so that when you go to the government, hey, the government will be overwhelmed, and they won't be able to say no when it's everyone together. I just thought I would put that in because this is what I do. <laughs> this, this is my thing. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, and it, this kind of, there was a lot of questions ar around the theme of what do I do? And, and I think that is something you can all relate to. So in your mind, what are the top three priorities for f strengthening the protection of the ag land in BC? What are the top issues that we should be focusing on? Hmm. I think the first one is educating all of our, uh, ourselves, our children, our grandchildren about the importance of food. Um, you know, the BC government does the odd thing well and, um, and right, and I, I, I think the program that they put in place a number of years ago, um, I'm not sure how many about feeding kids or putting veggies in, in the classroom and all that sort of thing. Pardon? BC's Home Food and Nutritional Program. Is right where it starts. It starts with the young folks. It starts with good nutrition. It starts with knowing where food comes from, how it's produced, small gardens in the backyard, um, university programs, uh, I, I think that's, if, if anything, that's number one, and from there it all, it all takes, takes off. And along that is, is, is the other one that, uh, you know, I, I'm reaching here. I could go, uh, everybody has a top three list. Number two, I think, is along with food is, is respect for the land, uh, not only the land that we we grow produce on it's 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 the land that we we grow trees on it's the land that that we live on it's the land that we walk on it's the water that that keeps our fish i mean i may sound maudlin here but i i'm not i i, I think we've we've got to get out of our head this the this thought and I think there's a lot of us and, and maybe I'm at the point in my life where where I've raped and pillaged enough and, and and I feel that, you know, our I'm not sure we as society have are going over the edge in terms of of um, exploiting our our assets, exploiting our land, exploiting our water, exploiting our resources. I think we can do all that, but we have to do it well, and, why, and we have to really make sure our agricultural land is looked after and it's there for, for the generations that follow. And, um, you know, as the third one, I, I'd say enjoy, enjoy the bounty that we have. Um, Make sure we're prepared to share. Uh, make sure we're prepared to share this this wonderful land that we've been given to live in and live on, and and um, and put some of the BS of the past behind us and move forward. And I think it it's and here I stand, and, and I'm it's time that I. People like me turn it over. I've, I've got so much time and so much respect for the young people that were, are coming behind us. You have no idea how much I learned at, at, uh, in the last number of years when I see these young kids. If there's anybody that ever says that our education system isn't working, and that's the big deal. That's what all of this is about is education. By gosh, some of these young people that come along have got a grasp of things that um, my mom and dad would never understand. I'm grappling with, but I think it's exciting. My kids are doing things that I would never do and aren't allowing us to do things. 
and the grandchildren that they're raising are are a next generation. I think we we have to. I guess to end, maybe I'm not sure end all of this, but we've got to turn this world over, and we've we've got to turn it over to these young folks, and if we turn it over in decent shape, and uh, I just think we've got a little too greedy, um, and I. I bothers the hell out of me to be honest with you and and having the, had the privilege of, of growing food that's that's been enjoyed around the world um, and grown it at other parts of the world and brought it here folks let's turn this part of our legacy over to our young people in good shape and I'm not sure we're doing that completely. So that's the thing that I, I'm not sure that's answering the question but that's heartfelt woman. Uh, let's, let's do that. If we can go away from here tonight and agree that uh, we can do things better, a lot better and not be critical of what went on in the past but let's not repeat it into the future. I'm sure you all will uh, join me in thanking Richard for being honest and forthright and, and, and sharing his thinking from his heart, I think. It's something uh, we all need to do more of, I believe. Richard, thank you so much for coming to sh be with us this evening. And um, thank you all for coming to be with Richard this evening. We're, we're, we're mighty glad you came. Thank you.